Well, good morning. Good morning. I have to say I agree with Jeff. I am a little envious of Kevin and so many others who sing so well. And uh, one thing, though, I never got a chance to sing, Jeff. Even though I pastored at Tippett's all those years, for some reason, all my singing activities got vetoed. I don't know what happened. I'm suspicious. I think it was the piano player. My wife was the piano player. So anyway, it's so good to be with you and with our friends. Uh, We've known Jeff. We've known Kevin. We've known Jennifer and Sheila for such a long time. And so we appreciate them and we appreciate you. Thank you for the good work that you're doing here in the Greenville community. Thank you for what you're doing, supporting missions and supporting uh, our work throughout North America. We appreciate that. I will bring up a little commercial. Uh, If you're interested in uh, learning more about helping others, check out this book that our friends have out there in the foyer. It's First Aid for Emotional Hurts. That's for you to help others. And there's some little booklets to help others with depression or anxiety. So you might check those out. And I do not want to get in trouble with Kevin, so he wants you to know there's a handout at the church app. So check that out on the church app. We've got a little handout of what we'll look at this morning. But take your Bibles, please, and turn to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. Somewhere in this room this morning, there is someone that feels as if they're in the cave. Maybe they're watching online. Maybe uh, they're not in a cave, literally, of course, but they feel like that. And if there isn't, if that's not you this morning, everyone in here knows someone, whether we realize it or not. But figuratively speaking, today they're in a cave. You don't have a country where 130 people take their lives without having enough, a lot of people that are in a cave. And so it's important for us to realize we have a God who wants to help us out of that cave. He wants to walk alongside of us if, if, if we're the one in the cave. If you're the one trying to help someone out, you have a God who goes with you everywhere you go, and he tries to help us as we try to help them. One of my favorite verses is James chapter 5, verse 17. It says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. So I read that passage in my Bible. I love the book of James, and as I do, I say, how am I like Elijah? And I just go through a few things that I know from the book of 1 Kings. There was a time where birds brought food to Elijah. And so I think to myself, well, birds have never brought food to me. So how is it that I'm like Elijah? You keep reading in 1 Kings and you notice there was a time when a boy died and he came back to life. Elijah prayed over him and he came back to life. Have you ever seen anything like that? I've not seen anything like that. So I say, then how am I like Elijah? I keep going and the enemies of Elijah saw fire come down from heaven. Have you ever seen anything like that where you prayed and wow, everybody realized, oh, your God is the God. I've never seen anything like that. And so I look at James 5 very closely and I noticed the wording there. It says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. His temperament, his attitude, if you will, was just like ours. And so I asked myself, what kind of attitude, what kind of nature, what kind of temperament did he have? And so for that, we look at 1 Kings chapter 19, beginning with verse 1. The Bible says, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and he ran for his life. And he went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. And he came, and he sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. And said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life. For I am no better 
than my father's. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this passage from so long ago. Help us this morning, whether we're in the cave or whether we know someone who is, help us to examine it and look at it and see what it means for us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. This morning, if you're in the cave or you know someone that is, you're in the right place. We have a God who's been helping people out of the cave. He's been helping people, helping those that feel stuck, that are in a bad way in their lives. He's been doing this for centuries. And the same God that helped Elijah is the same God who helps you. And so I think it's important to walk through this passage and look at what God, we can see what God actually did with someone who was as down as a person could ever be. And so the first thing we do is we ask ourselves, what happened to Elijah? How did he get to the place where he finds himself on the inside of this dark cave? And you might also say, what is it that increases a person's risk for depression or discouragement? And so the first thing I notice is that verse again, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Also, how he'd executed all the prophets with the sword. So this Ahab, bad guy. This Jezebel, bad woman. And she's been responsible for the murder of many of God's people. The Bible says in verse 2, Jezebel sent a messenger. So she says that Elijah, so let the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as one of them by tomorrow about this time. You have 24 hours. That's all you've got, Elijah. You're going to be dead in a day. Boom. That's what happened. And so as he heard those words, as he heard that message, and he's hearing it via messenger, he knows that she is going to do everything within her power to act on that. And she's done this kind of thing before. And so immediately he is afraid. He's frightened. The Bible says he saw that. And so as soon as he saw that and realized the situation he was in, it gripped him. Now, people will say Elijah shouldn't have done that. Perhaps. Has anyone ever threatened your life? I used to work in corrections and a couple of times, well, one time someone saw my license plate. Usually they were not in a situation where I could do that. And they said, oh, this is in Tennessee. They said, you're in Davidson County. And I felt a little uneasy. Another time I worked here in the state of North Carolina as a staff psychologist for a long time. And as I was doing that work, sometimes people would say they would threaten you. You know, they would let you know. And that night, you didn't really sleep too well. You were prepared. Even though you knew that person was incarcerated, and they couldn't come and get you. They might have a cousin or they might have somebody that would come your way. When someone threatens your life, it unnerves you. It gets under your skin, so to speak. And it got Elijah. Even though he'd seen God do these great things, it got him. And so you're sitting here this morning, what kinds of threats, what kinds of things might make you fearful? It could be a bad result from a, t a health test. It could be something going on at work. It could be something happening to your children. It could be your own marriage. It could be any number of things, but it gets you. And it's like your world begins to shake and you're like, oh, I don't know. And all of a sudden it can send you in a downward spiral if you're not careful. So the first thing, as powerful and as, as close to the Lord as Elijah was, he became over, he was overcome by fear. And it's a lesson to us. No matter how spiritual you are, you too can be overcome by fear if a guy like Elijah was and can go down this trail. Now, he, he had a response, and it's key how we respond. The Bible says that he ran for his life. So this is not us doing speed walking, right? This is running all out. And if you read this passage, he ran a marathon. He probably ran a couple of marathons. And you know, if you've ever run a marathon, you don't run all out the whole way. You kind of pace yourself. I don't think he's pacing himself. And so if you looked at his brain, he's probably depleting it of something called a neurotransmitter called serotonin, and he's getting tired. And so he experiences fatigue. And so again, the same thing happens with us. I'm trying to save my job, or I'm trying to save my marriage, or I'm trying to perhaps get in shape for my 
my health situation, and I'm always running. I am always off and so busy. And before you know it, you get worn down. You do business trip after business trip, and you're not getting the sleep that you ought. And so fatigue can lead one to be depressed, to be discouraged. And again, if it happened to Elijah, it can happen to us, and it can happen to the people that we know. You keep noticing there, and he did the worst thing he could have done. One of the worst things he could do, he isolated himself. He took his servant, and he left him, and he went all by himself. And so we start to be tired. We're very frightened, and the worst thing we can do is not be around people. I don't want to be around people. I don't want to talk to people. I don't want them bringing up this Jezebel business, or I don't want them bringing up what's happening in my family or what's happening at work. I want to be all by myself. No, 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 no. You don't want to isolate yourself. But that's what he did. He isolated himself. He wasn't going to church, you might say. He wasn't even going to work or anywhere else. He was all by himself. And so you ask yourself, what happened to him? He did that. And that's that. Then we come to verse 4, the verse we just read. He went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came and he sat down under a broom tree. So there's more fatigue. And he prayed that he might die. Now, did he mean that? People debate that. I think he wanted it all to be over with. He quit the ministry in verse 3 when he left his servant, I think. And then in verse 4, he says, God, I just want you to take me on. Take me away from this place. It's enough. And there's so much in this verse. Take my life, for I am no better than my father's. That's so powerful. We're all going to do it differently. We're going to do our family differently than our parents did it. We're going to do our workplace differently than our previous people did it. We're, I even have pastors. The church is going to be different because of the way they interact with the church. And so as you look at this last part, that's Elijah saying, I am worthless. I have failed. It's like peeling an onion off. He says, I'm no better than my father's. There's a lot behind that statement. And he feels like I was going to be different. It was going to be different with Jezebel. It was going to be different with Ahab and with Israel. And he saw things as they were. It's not. It's not. It's the same. And it unnerved him. And he goes in this downward spiral. If it happened to Elijah, it can happen to anyone. Because Elijah is a man with a nature like ours. This is his brain. This is a picture from the Mayo Clinic. And on the left is a depressed person. And you can see the red and the yellow is respiration is moving around, going into a room. The right, hopefully, is what our brains are looking like. And that's active and that's thinking. And so really, his brain is like in a fog. And, and Elijah might have said that. He might have said something like, I'm in a fog or I can't concentrate. Elijah might have been running and tears just fell out of his eyes and he couldn't explain it. That's the way he felt. It had overtaken his body and he was was in a mess, we used to say in eastern North Carolina. He was in a lot of trouble here. And again, if it could happen to Elijah, it could happen to any of us. But the good thing was God was there. Amen. And God showed up. In verse 5, the Bible says he's laying there. He slept under a broom tree. Boom. An angel touched him. And he said to him, arise and eat. Now, when I was working in other settings, I, I never worked until now full-time in a Christian ministry. And so I was working with a, a lot of different people. And one time I'm looking at a person, and she says to me, I say, you know, I think you're depressed. She says, I can't be depressed. Christians don't get depressed. And I'm also thinking uh, she didn't want to take the medicine I was, we were about to recommend for her too. You know, she didn't want to do any of that. I want you to notice the first thing that God did with Elijah was said, get up and eat. He addressed his physical needs. So he didn't go through and say, Elijah, what's wrong with you? You're a prophet of God. You shouldn't be here. You shouldn't be, do this. You shouldn't be doing this. He said, I want you to get up and I want you to eat. He addressed his physical needs. If you've ever been depressed, or you've ever helped someone with depression, it makes sense. They can't think. They can't process until you address that physical nature where they can move and they can concentrate again. And that's what God did. I want you to get up and I want you to eat. And almost always depression impacts eating. They either eat too much or they don't eat enough. And almost always in practice sleeping, they either sleep too much or they don't sleep enough. So he's like, you slept enough. Get up. Get up 
and eat. And so he addresses the physical. So if you are helping someone with depression, you want them to ask themselves, what are you putting in your body? And what is your physician or your, your primary care practitioner said to you? And if they're suggesting that you, you take some medication, I'm encouraging you to do that as well. Because the Lord said, arise and eat. Verse 6, he looked there at his head. And there you see baked on coals, there's a jar of water. So he ate and he drank and he lay down again. So there's a couple of things. The Lord shows up and he addresses the physical, but we're just getting started. We are just getting started. So he says, look, get up, eat this food. And the next thing he does, the angel of the Lord came back a second time. So it's not like the Lord shows up once and it's done. This is going to be a process. He touched him again and he said, arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and he ate and he drank and he went the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights as far as Oreb to the mountain of God. And so he's getting him on a routine. So he says to him, get up, get up at the same time every day, eat, eat at the same time every day. I would say eat again, you know, three times, eat at noon, eat again that evening, same time every day and go to bed at the same time. He's really getting him on a routine is what the Lord is doing. And if you're trying to help someone, you want to do the same thing. Get up at the same time. Well, I didn't go to sleep until 4.30 this morning. Get up and you'll sleep better tonight. That's our hope. It's not always true, but it's our hope. So we get up at the same time. We go to bed at the same time. And we get him on this routine. And as we do that, we find that they become more active or we become more active. And as we become more active, we begin to have a little more hope. Like maybe I can get through this whole thing. And then our mood gets a little bit better. And then before you know it, all of a sudden we've got a little bit more energy. If we don't do this, we just stay down and we can go way, way down, really to the place where we see Elijah. And so the Lord comes, he addresses the physical, he gets him on a routine, and you think everything's going to be okay. Well, I want you to look first of all at verse 9 real quick. I didn't put that on the screen. It's in verse 9 that he goes into a cave, okay? So we're, we're addressing the physical. We're getting him on a routine, and now he goes into the cave. That's the worst thing you could do, and that's sometimes what we do. He goes into this cave, verse 9 says, and he spent the night in that place, which is dark and damp, and again, not a good place to be. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him again and said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? That is gold. That is the question you always want to ask. He didn't say, what's wrong with you? He says, what are you doing here? And it's open. He didn't say, are you down or are you depressed? Yes. That's a closed question. When he asked him that question, Elijah has to think and say, well, what am I doing here? And he says, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left and they seek to take my life. That's a lot of words for a depressed person. And so what the Lord has done by asking this open-ended question, instead of getting a one-word answer or one sentence, he gets a paragraph. And when he gets this paragraph, that brain is working. And there's some yellow that pops up. Not orange, but there's some yellow. And it's making those neurotransmitters move a little bit, crossing these synapses, and things are starting to happen. And so you're working with someone, or you're yourself in a situation. You ask, what am I doing here? What are you doing here? That process of thinking that through and mentioning it is helping you heal. But do look at what he said. He says he's been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. True. He says that the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant and torn down your altars. True. And then he says, and killed your prophets with the sword. That's true. But he says, I am alone. I alone am left and they seek to take my life. This is classic depression. You take one thing, and you pile it on and turn it into a big thing. He's not all by himself. There's this guy by the name of Obadiah who had hidden all these different prophets and saved them from Jezebel. He knows him because he ran into him. And Obadiah's like, hey, uh, you told me to go find Ahab. Do you not care about my life? He probably didn't. He's thinking he's a lone ranger. He's all on his own. 
He's not the only person. That's what happens. So we say, listen to yourself. Listen to the words you're saying. And listen to the things that people tell you. The Bible says in verse 11 that God said to him straight up, get out. Go out. Get out of this cave. Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. So, first thing, we got to get out. If we're in our house, got to get the shades up. Got to turn the lights on, but we need natural sunlight. And truly, we've got to get out. Even on a day like today when it's kind of chilly, put a bunch of clothes on. Get out there and walk. And so he says, you get out of this cave. Behold, the Lord passed by in a great strong wind. And the Bible says it tore into the mountains and it broke the rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. So stop and think about that. He sees, he can see the wind and the reactions of it. Now, you're probably not going to see this, but you are going to see the trees. You're going to see the birds, and you could see the sunset, and the sunrise. And it's a way of reminding us of passages like Matthew 6. If I took care of the birds and I put the flowers here, I'll take care of you. I'm watching you. I know every hair that's on your head, he's saying. And so he's saying to him, get outside and let these things happen and let God work with you in his creation. And then the Bible says, The Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And so God is showing him things through the creation, just like God shows us today. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And so you're depressed. Everywhere you go, God is there. And so what you're trying to do is listen for him. And you're trying to hear him. And you can hear him in his scripture. You look at the scripture. And if if you memorize scripture, he's going to bring some of those scriptures. He'll bring back Matthew chapter 6. And he'll remind you. You see that bird over there? I got him. I got you. You know, he'll, he'll remind us of that. And the Bible says... It was, uh, so it was, verse 13, Elijah heard it. He wrapped his face in his mantle. He went out and he stood in the entrance of the cave and suddenly a voice came to him. And he said, what are you doing here, Elijah? It's the same question, same question and the same response. Verse 14 says, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. And they seek to take my life. That's rumination. So people that struggle with trauma, people that can't get past grief, and when we're depressed and anxious, we focus on these same things, these same messages, and we say them over and over again. Usually running is good for us, but I can about promise you as Elijah's running, this is what he's saying. And so as he's saying this, he's just depleting his brain of serotonin. He's getting worse and worse. And he's saying something to him that's a lie. And so look at your thinking and ask yourself, is this true? It's not true. This is not true. And so we want to make sure what we're saying is true. And also, instead of ruminating, thinking about bad things, we want to come back and meditate, think about good things, not pie in the sky, but Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly and go through the whole chapter. Psalm 139, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That's what we want going into our mind as we're running or as we're walking around in God's creation, focusing on the truth. Focus on the problem. In verses 15 through 17, the Lord said to him, go. So do notice the Lord listened. And usually when people ruminate, if you're helping a depressed person, Next time that, that person sees that depressed person, they're like, oh, here comes George. Oh, I think I'm over here. I'm needed over here. And we avoid the person that ruminates because they bring us down, right? I'm sorry if your name is George. But anyway, uh, the, we avoid them. God listened to him. Now, notice God didn't say a whole lot, but he listened to him. But once he finishes in verse 14, he just turns around and says, you got to go. Get out of this cave and go. Go and return your way to the wilderness of Damascus. So this is like, go back to work. Go back to school. Go back to wherever you came from. In other words, get busy with your life. That's what God says to him. Now, he gives him a to-do list. And everybody needs a to-do list. He says, I want you to go and I want you to anoint Hazael as king of Syria. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. 
and Elijah, the son of Shaphath of Abel, Meholah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. And it shall be, and said, Lord, saying, this is going to fix some things. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Haziel, Jehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elijah will kill. And this is the Lord saying, it's going to work out. It's going to work out. But you got to get your to-do list and you got to work your to-do list. Now, if you're a reader of, a bi- of your Bible, I know you are. You know, this was decades long, this whole process. And that's the point. You always have to have a to-do list. When I was pastoring, somebody gets laid off in November. And everybody's like, you know, they're never going to hire anybody in December. No, 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 no. You get ready. You get that resume going. You have to have a to-do list. You have to have things you're doing and working toward. And secretly, it's not so much the success of those activities. It's the doing the activity of it all that creates the action and makes you more hopeful. And so the Lord says, I want you to go and I want you to anoint this person. But it's not just go and anoint him, then go and anoint this one. And then go and anoint this one. In other words, you've got a lot of stuff to do, Elijah. Get busy. Go back to the place you came from and start working the problem. And our problems are insurmountable, right? So it's like eating an elephant one bite at a time. And this is a big problem. God's not saying it's not, but it's like you've got a process that you are to engage in and you're just supposed to be faithful through this process and go and get active on that particular problem. Now, it's interesting. You've got Elisha, you know, well, well, before we get to that, God does come back. He listens and he says, yet I have reserved 7,000 Israel, all whose knees have bowed to Baal, and uh, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So at some point, we listen, we give them activities, but at some point we come back and like, whoa, 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 whoa. You say that no one cares about you. No one? No one cares about you? Your wife? Your children? Your parents? Your dog? You know, you break, break all the way through it. Somebody cares about you. I care about you. So you challenge the faulty thinking. Don't you walk around saying no one cares about you. You say that you've never done anything right. Really? Actually, sometimes on a to-do list, it's make up your bed. It's wash dishes. And we go by, ooh, you did that right. You know, you do something right. So we go through, we, we come back, we take faulty thinking, and we attack that with the truth. You say that God doesn't care about you. That's not true. Psalm 139, God made good stuff, fearfully and wonderfully made. And then we get them focusing on scriptures about the Lord sent his son to die for you. He cares about you. Focus on the truth. And we try to nail that down and focus on other people. He departed from there, verse 19 says, and he found Elisha, the son of Shaphath, who was plowing with the 12 oxen, a 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he was with the 12th. Elijah passed by him. He threw his mantle on him. There's a lot to this. Elisha is a good guy and he has a lot of talent. He's got a lot of capability. And that's part of what I think he's sharing with us. He's got all these oxen. He has resources. And the Bible says in verse 20, he left the oxen. He ran after Elijah. He said, please let me kiss my father and my mother. And this is kind of reminds us of some of the people that said, you know, let me bury my parents and I'll go and follow you, Jesus. And basically he's got a similar response. He said, go back again for what have I done to you? In other words, none of this, I'm going to follow you halfway or not. I'm, I want you to come on and let's get busy following and serving the Lord together. As you struggle, it's important to get our minds on someone else. We're depressed after the loss of a loved one, and we pour our life into someone else who has recently lost a loved one. We're going through difficulty after losing our job. We're trying to help someone else, but our mind gets off ourselves, and it gets on someone else, and that's what God does with Elijah. You are working with Elisha, and in pouring your life into him, you're no longer thinking about your own needs. You're thinking, I got to get him set up. I've got to get him ready so that he is able to make progress. The Bible says Elisha turned back from him. He took his yoke, he slaughtered them, and he boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment, and he gave them to the people, and they ate. And then he arose and followed Elijah, and he became his servant. And the writer is letting us know Elisha was all in. All in. There's no turning back. 
There's no going down, following Elijah, and then turning back. There's nothing to go back to. And so he's focusing on someone, and they're going along. And as they're doing this, Elijah is really getting his mind back on God. What has God put me here to do? And he's got him fo himself focused back on the mission that God has given him. The mission to carry on and to share with others and his bro and what's happening in this grand time you've got with Ahab and Jezebel. Now, if we were writing a Hallmark movie, this would all go great real quickly. But we go to chapter 20, and actually Ahab wins a battle against someone else that's wicked. And so it's like, what's up with that? And then we come to chapter 21, and there's this nice man, Naboth. He's got a vineyard. And this mean guy, Ahab, wants it, tries to get it wrongly. And this mean woman, Jezebel, conspire, and Naboth loses his life. So there's all this that happens in between. But then we come to chapter 21. I love chapter 21. The Lord gives a message to Elijah, and he says, I want you to go, and I want you to tell this to Ahab. And so this guy had been running all the time. In verse 20, he finds, or he finds Ahab. And Ahab said to Elijah, have you found me, O my enemy? This means he is looking for Ahab. And he answered, I have found you because you have sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. He's no longer running. He's no longer scared almost to death. He is chasing down the people who have threatened him. Behold, the Lord says, I will bring calamity on you. I'm bringing this message from God. He's going to bring calamity on you. I will take away your posterity. I will cut off from Ahab every male in Israel, both bond and free. This guy that was running two marathons, hiding in caves, he comes out and he's looking for this man and he's on mission with the Lord. And you say, we didn't say anything about Jezebel there. We didn't have time to put up. But in verse 22, he says, and this is what's going to happen to Jezebel. He's no longer overcome by depression. He's no longer hiding in the cave. He is on mission with the Lord. And so for us, we have to walk through this life. And we have to know God wants to take us and use us, not because he needs us, but it's part of being in his family to serve him and to follow him. And so he helps us to come out of the cave, and he helps us to help other people come out of the cave. And in that process, we hope that many of these people will come to the saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ because only he is truly the answer for what bothers them. God has a sense of humor. And so this lady said, you'll be dead in 24 hours. And this godly man said, I want to die. And he never died. God takes him. God puts him on a chariot, a fire, and he sends him to heaven. And I do think it's important to think that through for just a little bit. Because the thing that you're most worried about, the thing that frightens you the most, God's like, it's not a thing. It does not matter to me. And I believe part of what he's doing in this process is saying, Elijah, I got you. And I've always had you. And you quit on me, buddy, but I never quit on you. We have a God that walks with us all the way, even when we quit, even when we don't want to go on. He helps us on the worst day, the worst days of our life. And so this morning, you sit here, and maybe you're in the cave. Step one is ask the Lord Jesus to come into your life. He'll forgive you of your sins. If you repent of those, he'll come into your life. And you can follow him until the day you die. He will walk with you every step of the way, come what may. And then he'll usher you into his presence when you pass away from this earth. You know someone that's struggling with these kinds of issues. I beg you to be the person that goes to them, that comes alongside of them, that helps them, that goes on walks with them in the morning, that asks them, have you taken your medicine? Have you eaten today? What time do you go to bed? What time are you getting up? That shows them the word of God and what they really mean to our Lord Jesus.
Will you be that person? Father, we thank you for this passage. And we thank you for how it's helped people all through church history, all through time. So many people in heaven today that have been helped by this passage and knowing that Elijah, a man who was just like them, had the same kind of temperament, the same kind of problem that we struggle with. Help us, Lord, to put our faith in you. Help us, Lord, to follow you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And help us, Lord, also to be looking to others, looking around us and looking at what we might be able to do to help them to follow you and to help them through the great difficulties that they encounter, that we all encounter at different times in our lives. It's in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, that we pray and we ask these things. Amen.